I'm Sanjana and could I take 30 seconds to just lay out the problem statement and the context of our conversation today. Um, so, of course, these are numbers that everybody knows, but 94% of our women working in our economy are in the informal segment, most of whom coalesce around agriculture, manufacturing, home-based businesses. Um, on average, Indian women spend about five hours a day working from home on unpaid domestic and caregiving activities, as opposed to about 30 to 40 minutes by men. Now, what's the interesting thing about this data point is in India, since our independence, we've done time use surveys to understand this only twice. Once in 2000, uh, one in 99, and then it took 20 years to do it again in 2019. The reason I'm bringing it up is it gives you a sense of how sort of low priority it is at the data disaggregation level to understand the kinds of constraints and guardrails that face women entrepreneurs, that we've only done one time use survey in the past, in this century. Um, to add to that, 92% of the women in the age group of 15 to 59 who are participating in unpaid domestic activities versus only a 29% of men, but these are the majority of job seekers as well. Uh, and finally, I think the reason for this conversation is given that a lot of aspiring women entrepreneurs start their journey from the guardrails of their home. Who's doing research and development? Who's doing discovery, problem diagnosis, and understanding of opportunities for this segment? Uh, so that's why I have a bunch of heavy hitters here today uh, who are going to unpack a little bit of this and try and create solutions for it. Uh, so today we have with us Pradnya, who doesn't need, actually nobody needs an introduction, <laughs> full disclosure. Uh, but Pradnya is the CEO of Deastra, who is legendary in this segment for powering uh, home-based entrepreneurs and mass entrepreneurship before it was even called that. We've learned so much from what Pradnya has already built and her amazing team. So we're looking forward to hearing from her today. Uh, we then have Sairi, of course, who's taken a community approach to building tech and an extraordinary layer of money as well. So Sairi is the founder of Mahila Money and Shiro's. And we've had the good fortune of talking to entrepreneurs who benefited from her very collateral light access to working capital to set up their businesses. Many of whom are on Instagram, many of whom I'm a happy customer of. So uh, I'm also a fan girl a little bit. Um, then we have Dr. Niharika, who, of course, legendary in everything inclusion and gender and leads a piece of work that uh, we're engaged with in Delhi, with the Delhi Skills University on sort of empowering and unlocking mass entrepreneurship via Angarwadis. Dr. Niharika, of course, is the vice chancellor of the Delhi Skills and Entrepreneurship University. And uh, sorry, I feel like I'm missing one on my screen. And sorry, and then we have Preeti. I, can, I couldn't see you, sorry. So Preeti is an extraordinary example of someone who's discovered a sort of future-focused business model and made uh, a substantial revenue from it. Uh, she's a mushroom farmer. And the reason we're bringing it up is because Preeti in many ways uh, embodies all the constraints that a lot of us are trying to solve. Home-based, high-value, emergent opportunities. So we're going to hear from her a little bit about her journey of how she discovered the opportunity, how she monetized it, what her journey looks like, and what we can do to amplify and create many more creepies. Uh, so to begin with, I'd just like to invite uh, Pradnya to share a few thoughts on the original conception of the business templates of the Astra and where they are now and uh, what, how you're seeing it go forward. Uh, thank you, Sanjana, and thank you for having me here and to uh, everybody here in this roundtable uh, discussion. Is, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a fabulous learning experience for me. Um, so instead of talking about you know, the business templates, why don't I show them to you? So if you'll allow me to share my screen, let me go through those and then I'll come back to the history if you want me to cover the history. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so what I'm going to be showing you here is yes, these things off. Uh, is those business templates, the business in a box that we uh, created back in 2015-17 time frame. Um, and the idea was, uh, can we create um, handbooks or a um, you know a guide a book um, for business for somebody who wants to start particular businesses? And that's where this um, this idea came from. And I'm just going to quickly log in here. 
then show you some samples. So this will also uh, show you how to get in there if you want to, to sort of have a look at them yourself. This is open source, so you can just sign up, get in, and you can go into the offerings business guides over here. And this is where you'll see 75 business templates. So this is, these are the kinds of businesses that we actually looked at at that time. And these are the ones that are really the ones that are local, traditional, the ones that uh, the Astra Foundation actually um, looks at um, and uh, you know, tries to provide the wherewithal and the support to uh, start those businesses and also to grow them. So if you, look, you see academic coaching classes, interior designing services, you know, a whole bunch of them, and there's about 75 of them that you can look at. I'm gonna go into fashion designing. Okay? And this is what the template looks like. Um, now it's, it's split up into six stages and six steps. And each step of this journey is actually a step to be taken by an aspiring fashion designer, for example, right? And it starts with the planning stage. And if you go through step by step, it starts right from setting up your vision, mission, you go to the next step. Um, and I'm going to show you a few of the actionables here. So this is really what we would uh, call the competition analysis the, in terms of um, business planning. So when you go through here, you can actually uh, work through this case study or build your own. You go out, you do your research, you, you put in uh, your inputs, you add more competitors. And based on that, you sort of do your SWOT analysis, and this wizard will actually give you uh, the uh, the template that you can go through for that. Uh, similarly, you know something uh, that we would normally do as market research. So this is a step by step guide and a template to do your market research. So who are your target customers? Um, if they're not the ones that have been noted here in the case study, then put your own. Uh, this is all editable. What are their needs, etc. And um, you fill this out, and then you go to the next step. So this is just the planning stage. Now, when you go to the next steps, um, what you will see is there's a, a section on the financials, right? So, so in, you did your competitive, competitive analysis, you did your market research. Now you want to uh, look at your financials and the previous page would have talked about your sales numbers. For those sales numbers, uh, here is a template to say here for any fashion uh, designing um, boutique or a or if you're looking at this business, here are the heads that you should consider. Um, and it also would have benchmarks to say, to make that uh, sale, what is it in terms of um, expense that you should be considering, what percentage? And again, these are all editable. So if you go in and you sort of say, hey, my, my percent uh, annual increase will be 12, all the numbers you must have seen changed over here. So you can actually go in and do your business modeling over here, your business planning over here. Make sure that you haven't missed anything. You have the template there uh, to say what heads you should be considering. And you go through these steps. And finally, what you would do is hit on what's called a project report. It's really a business plan. This takes a couple of minutes. So I have a canned one here, which came out from the system. And this is what that would look like. So everything that you put in your business planning stages would appear here. Um, and you would actually get all your financials as well. So the cost of project, the means of finance. And the way we did this one was to speak with the lenders, the banks um, actually, and understand their process and uh, see what they required to see as part of a business plan and projections to make a good uh, judgment in terms of lending. So this is what you would see over here. I'm going to close this here. It will, uh, it will show you the same thing over here. Um, so, so that's what we did. And uh, then, you know, the, the next couple of steps are really about funds. Um, I think something here interesting that I also wanted to show you uh, in terms of the business template is um, the single window approach to getting, for example, um, a checklist of things that you would require if you're taking your premises on rent. So you would get a list of um, what you would require. You can go uh, checking it off so that you know you've covered everything and then you go and get your leave license agreement for example, right? Sorry, I think I went on mute here. Uh, there's also things like uh, getting your pan and your tan. So if those things are uh, things that you want to you know, sort of get done, then this will give you a, a let's do it page, an actionable page where you can actually go in um, and it takes you to the pan card set, right? So 
we, we built it almost like a single window um, playbook uh, of sorts. And I'm going to stop this one here um, and really talk about um, you know, how, how this went, because I think this give, gives you a feel for what, uh, what the business template and the business in a box really looks like. Um, what we found um, actually was, uh, you know, this was becoming quite overwhelming for uh, for folks who wanted to start a business, and they uh, they sort of saw the whole thirty six stage matrix, and um, you know, in a self service approach, uh, they felt that it was too much. Um, so we sort of repurposed it into various formats. So what you'll see here is, um, you know, an instructor led kind of a manual out of the same content. Um, but this is more uh, somebody who is facilitating, who will be teaching this and then getting the work done. Uh, this we also, um, with NSTC, we sort of translated it into various languages so that it could be used at the various training partners um, to, you know, sort of help the, the training partners to in turn facilitate. I'm going to stop sharing here for a bit. Um, so, so this is really the concept of a business in a box and repurposing it to make it less overwhelming for those who are not very, um, uh, they didn't want to take the self-service approach and not get overwhelmed by all those steps. Um, the, uh, where we saw the biggest pickup of this was with people who could use a computer with a desktop, uh, they could use this with a laptop, uh, right? And uh, those who, um, who were able to digest a lot of information um, at one go. Um, but we do understand that, uh, you know, there is a whole demographic who might not be able to use this in self-service mode. And therefore, you know, the, uh, the, what we're trying to do now is to figure out, fine, workbooks is one way, but what is another guided approach that can be done, uh, right, to, with the same uh, content to be able to reach to uh, uh, those who cannot use, uh, use this uh, themselves. Um, and that's what we've been working on. We also took, um, you know, the approach of unboxing some of the parts to say, hey, if you want to come in and you're looking at funding, for example, let's give you something that is specifically on funding in terms of information and knowledge. Um, that's one big piece that's missing. What are the schemes available, et cetera? So let's look at that. Uh, the second piece is if you want to do the things yourself, then here are some checklists that will help you to do specifically get ready for funding. There's some education and awareness that can also happen. And then if you want somebody to help you with your business planning, or if you, or if you want um, a, a service provider or an expert to come in and help you with your business planning or preparing your project report, then also setting up the service um, partner ecosystem to do that. Um, so, so we sort of unboxed a few parts of it, uh, but the box is ready for 75, um, for 75 businesses. And Sanjana, what I wanted to say here is for the future focused uh, businesses and new business ideas that come out, it's readily available to just plug in the content and these can be very easily um, just put up there, put up on uh, the tech platform and provided as uh, open source for public good. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think one of the, uh, my follow on questions would, you know, first is, it's incredible how well you've actually mapped the user journey and behavior of home-based women entrepreneurs and really tapping into all the pieces and double clicking on very specific support areas they need as a, as an, at an individual level. But uh, our context of our conversation, if you remember, was, you know, a lot of these businesses and when these templates were created, it was pre-pandemic. The world was very different. And a lot of uh, market linkages, et cetera, were also not happening online or enabled digitally. So as we think about a version two of these templates, one is on the input side, of course, there are opportunities to make these higher value, greening them, et cetera. And then on the market linkage side to enable those connections. Uh, and then just as an opportunity discovery, I wanted to understand how do you seek out uh, new areas to sort of create templates on? And what's your resource? If you can help us understand a little bit, that would be great. Sure. So, so these ones that we created were really uh, the traditional businesses that, um, that there were a lot of training programs around at that time. Um, and we believe that if there are training programs for those, then there is a need for it. And some of these students that come out would quite naturally want to get into business rather than be um, get into a job or after one or two years of doing a job and getting experience, they would want to do this. So, so that's where that idea came from for these 75 uh, templates. Plus these are traditional businesses which means that there are a lot of best practices which we studied from existing entrepreneurs, from experts, from faculty, from online sources, 
And we sort of consolidated and normalized all of that um, and put it up there in this template. Um, so, so I think, you know, moving ahead, um, if there are ideas uh, that can pan out into a business plan that have already been tested, there are best practices, uh, the infrastructure is there, as I said, and those ideas can be very nicely converted into these um, business in a box kind of templates and provided uh, onwards. Fantastic. So we'll circle back around our ask, which is honestly about crowdsourcing ideas. Uh, we've been at GAME talking to uh, anyone who listened from the for-profit sector, whether it's been dark kitchens, electric charging units, etc., to find out what these opportunities are. But we'd love to hear uh, from the audience where you think these market linkages aren't really a huge problem and the opportunity exists at home. So I'm just going to move over to Dr. Niharika. Uh, and I actually wanted you to unpack for us the Delhi Anganwadi program because at uh, at an India scale right now, this is the only sort of structured mass entrepreneurship for uh, or for this particular segment. And in that context, uh, your thoughts on how templates can be used, adapted, what can we learn and do better? Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Sanjana, and, and thank you, Pradanya, uh, Pradanya, for sharing what you shared. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, so I think where we started with was that, um, you know, the university, because it is called a skill and entrepreneurship university, uh, wanted to actually also focus on the entrepreneurship, but not just for those who walk into the doors of the university, but take some of the university to the, um, um, you know, to the corners of the city or the state. Um, and, and we thought that uh, the best thing for us would be to actually uh, look at how we can improve, how we can uh, encourage or help women who obviously, you know, as you've rightly pointed out, uh, have child care responsibilities, have home care responsibilities. And, and if you put them in the context in which many of them live, uh, they possibly just have lack of opportunities and sometimes lack of training, lack of networks, uh, lack of any kind of access to the market because for many women, even the more educated ones, a lot of it comes from their, um, from the men in the family. And for many of them, the men in the family are also not really uh, of the affluent or of the more um, even the hustlers right so so in a way you have the you have a large number of women who are stuck um, who want to do something that was some of our conversations uh, that is what they revealed but at the same time they really had no opportunities and options for them and therefore we thought that as a university what we would do is we would work with the uh, with these women and first we set off a very modest goal saying we will have at least a hundred women become micro entrepreneurs um, and and with the with the with so much noise in the environment and now I'm not saying noise in a bad way but for startups and for unicorns and for um, you know the big businesses and and tech related businesses and so on and so forth this seems almost like something that nobody really wants to pay attention to uh, so women who who might want to run a stitching class or who might want to run a, <clears throat> um, a, a masala packing unit uh, or or any of these or a beauty um, uh, beauty parlor uh, small one at that uh, so uh, so the whole idea was to work with that fortunately for us um, you know the women and child department of delhi um, also uh, you know extended its hand and said that they already have something that is interesting that's happening in delhi which is four to five anganwadis have already been have been joined as a anganwadi hub so and and they have four different pillars so one is just talking you know so that they can get to talk to each other the other is helping them with government uh, plans and and any any things that are available for them to take use of the third is food and you know better nutrition and the fourth of course is um, uh, you know uh, what they called as um, now it is skipping my mind but it's um, basically on enterprise but uh, for most people, they didn't have 
uh, you know, from what we understood from the uh, from the women and child department, uh, while these were pillars that were defined for them, but how to get women to actually get to enterprise seemed to be something like a black hole. And we thought that this seemed like a very good plug for us to work with. Uh, so work with women uh, in their context, um, present them with a number of good um, business ideas. So the business in the box therefore makes a lot of sense. Help them to actually start a business by doing some of the most practical things um, uh, like the Deastra found the website has like, you know, how do you get your GST? How do you just little, little things, right? So how do you get all of that done? Um, so remove the friction uh, from off setting up the business and handhold them so that they can actually start their own business and yet not and make sure that it is not framed as a dole. It's not framed as a as a handout. Um, you know, we want to help the uh, the poorer women. No, it's uh, it is really about uh, getting them educated, set and motivated to start their own businesses, which they will run irrespective of whether university or game or anybody else is there or not there. Uh, and even if they don't run the business that we have helped them set up or they started with, maybe they set up another one. But the fact is that they taste what it is to uh, start a, um, um, a successful business. So that's really our plan. Right now, a lot of it is in how we want it to be. What will happen? We will tell you another year later. But right now, we are at a point where uh, I think the um, the... The, M the MOU is signed. Um, we are uh, starting to hire, you know, hire, look for fellows uh, on the ground who will work with the women uh, in their communities. Um, and and hopefully uh, this will take off and the help of all of you, um, Preeti, Pradnya, uh, Sanjana, Soumya um, and um, Sairi uh, would be really, really useful for us. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Niharika. That's very useful to lay the groundwork. So everyone who would love to help us amplify Delhi work, uh, we'll put our email address and reach out to you. Uh, everyone here knows I'm shamelessly uh, sort of forward in asking for support for women entrepreneurs. Uh, I'd like to just move to Sairi next. And before I start, uh, I actually wanted to uh, caveat with an interesting conversation I had. Uh, so a couple of days ago, I was talking to a uh, sort of a women incubator accelerator out of Mathura. And Mathura apparently has about 18,000 beauticians. Uh, and I said, that's a, a surprisingly high number. I said, I'm sure everyone doesn't want to look like, you know, they're on the cover of Vogue, but they said something interesting. Most of the women in Mathura are, uh, who, who sort of learn how to be a beautician are in the 20 to 24 age. Now their parents don't want to invest money in them because they think they'll get married and it's a sunk cost. Um, banks don't want to give them money because one, once you get married, you will have a child and you're not bankable. So interestingly, they said, uh, we go to Shiro's or Mahila Mani and figure out what we need and then get on Urban Company. And I thought in that context, I must come to you and say, how are you thinking about home-based women entrepreneurs? And they form a large part of uh, the Shiro's community. And what are some of the initiatives that you have that we can learn from and take forward? Uh, thank you, Sanjana, and it's so great to hear about uh, the work Pradnya is doing and Niharika, of course. Uh, and of course, we are a little bit of a partner and a beneficiary. I constantly hear these conversations. And uh, so look, uh, very fundamentally, uh, you know, I've been a tech founder all my life. And uh, the adventure back, we come from the, if I may use the term, the bro club of, you know, of, of uh, entrepreneurship. But there are some some good parts to that world, which is uh, there is a playbook that works. So clearly, you know, the best ecosystems have excellent networks, you know, and of course, uh, uh, and access to capital is abundant, you know, and the reason Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley is because there's enough capital. And third is access to resources, you know, exactly what we just heard, uh, you know. And in our ecosystem, what we've realized is uh, 
Seven years ago, we started as a jobs and careers platform for women. And we all know India's women in workforce numbers, especially formal workforce numbers, are pretty dismal. They continue to be actually dismal. But today, we're a country that's a little higher on entrepreneurship. And you know maybe that's a good thing, because then we will become a lot more self-reliant and you know take charge. What we are really seeing is a revolution of entrepreneurship playing out. You know, basically, whether you call it or not, everyone, every woman is an entrepreneur today. You know, I go back to my favorite example of English for English. You know, here's Sri Devi, who nobody thinks is an entrepreneur. She's she's a homemaker. She's invisible, and I think every woman that probably Pradhan described or Harika described, these women are invisible in their homes and societies. They are. They are probably identity less, and therefore nobody thinks that money matters are important in their lives. You know, so one of the uh, single largest challenges we figured: women have no access to capital. First, they don't make inheritance. Two, their employment history is checkered. Three, uh, they're a little invisible, which means that nobody thinks that you know they should be given an entrepreneurial check. Uh, and that's exactly what we're trying to do: is uh, we we learned that uh, this is the simplest way to really make more women jump in because you know capital is the biggest lubricant of entrepreneurship, putting money in hands of women. And historically, there's enough data to say this model works. You know, whether it worked in microfinance or it worked elsewhere. And uh, so uh, you know, going back to the Mathura example, uh, beauty parlor is actually the largest segment we lend to. You know, because I guess it, there is a little bit of a domination there and there is the barriers are a little lower. It's easier to convince your parents or your husband or uh, the familiar pressure. The thing that makes it easy for women to use what we offer is actually really simple. And it's a little shameful if I say, for example, one of the promises we make is that you don't have to tie this to your family. We don't need to know what your father does or what your husband does. This is yours. So whether you do well or don't, don't do well or wherever you go, it's yours. So uh, second is, I think, the digital only access. You unfortunately, you don't have to step outside the house is still a thing, you know, and, and, and that's why we are able to reach really, really small corners of the country because thanks to payments and everybody on, on you know, on a mobile is really sort of fueling this and third is we we hope that this is not just a loan it's an opportunity for you to uh, to continue to grow you know so it's not a transactional relationship so although we are uh, uh, we are putting putting a check in your hands we hope that you come back more often for all the mentoring all the learning all the resources that are available to you and it's not just uh, you know, uh, taking a loan. It's also thinking about your life in a little more holistic way. So historically, we've, we've built that holistic ecosystem for us. There's a free counseling helpline. There are learning resources. We run a large digital accelerator program. So all these pillars have been there. What we've found is when you add capital to the mix, it just makes it stick. You know, it just makes it whole thing to say this person is really willing to back me. And, uh, uh, and I don't have, um, I don't have to worry about validation from the rest of the world, which is historically a challenge. It is an identity problem. So, so in some ways, we, we're really doing very simple things, but uh, it seems to work. That's fantastic. Uh, so just you said two things which really caught my attention. And one was around the issue of identity. And I have an interesting anecdote because we spend a lot of time trying to just unpack who is the persona of the customer we're serving, the woman entrepreneur. And uh, I, I love gardening and I go to a little nursery nearby and uh, the nursery owner happens to be a woman entrepreneur. Her name is Vishnu. And uh, she, I've been going there for years. She's very good at gardening. But over the course of years, I discovered she actually is good at a whole range of things. You know, she's like the local volleyball team captain. She volunteers, she has another side business, etc. And I asked her one day, I said, why didn't you tell me you do all these amazing things? Uh -huh. And she said, if the bank manager finds out I do more than horticulture, I won't get a loan. If my mother-in-law finds out I have friends, uh, she'll think I'm spending. Best, nobody knows that my identity is beyond this minimal 
person of who I am. And I really reflected on this with all of us. And I feel like we do minimize ourselves because of the nature of narratives and identity is such a strong piece. And a second, uh, just to add to what you said on identity, it's also sort of, ex, uh, it's seen and visible in the way we are measuring data for women entrepreneurs. Uh, there's this sort of horrible, uh, when you say gender disaggregated, it's a line table with men and women, and that's not really what it is. If you look at how data for women entrepreneurs is measured, it is neither measured over a period of time or across the different identities or roles uh, that a woman entrepreneur plays. It's, it's ex measured the exact way a man does and his roles and identities don't change. Uh, so in fact, I loved what Pradnya is doing with you know, helping legal identity, et cetera. And I love that Saidi, you're helping break down these barriers of identity and access, which are constantly a problem. Um, so I think I just, with that, I want to go to a woman entrepreneur, Amritava, founder of Preeti, uh, and just understand, uh, Preeti, if you can help us, how you discovered your business model, what's your experience been, and what's your plan going forward? What was the pandemic like for you? Yeah, sure. Thank you for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be a part of this uh, great uh, discussion. And uh, uh, I started uh, my business in 2019 with the oyster mushroom cultivation. And uh, with the use of uh, bioenzymes, that I don't want to use any harmful or toxic chemicals, uh, so it is safe for the grower consumer in an environment. So the business idea is uh, uh, the reason is uh, <clears throat> I was searching some food options uh, that is good for uh, my kid, my son, just because when he was diagnosed as a gluten sensitive intolerance or uh, celiac. Uh, so, and I uh, was unable to digest milk and uh, he doesn't like uh, milk, egg and non-veg. So I got to know about the oyster mushrooms, that they are uh, super food, abundant in um, nutrition and best alternative for the uh, dairy and uh, animal dairy, animal based food product. And uh, it is, and uh, it involves uh, vertical farming uh, and requires let, uh, less land and water. And also it's a healthy option at affordable price. So, and in 2020, I uh, started online training. So I utilized my uh, time in pandemic uh, time just because by training, uh, providing training uh, to others and connected with some farmers. Uh, so uh, now we are procuring dried oyster mushrooms uh, directly from farmers and making the uh, oyster mushroom based products uh, with the help of women. So it contributes to their empower, empowerment and uh, and uh, help and they help us for the making of mushroom based products. So it generates a source of income for them and the job. And thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. So I think I just also want to double click on what you said at the end. The amount of evidence and research on the kinds of businesses women entrepreneurs start and what the sort of returns on that are for the community is enormous, right? If you look at every report we're talking about, we'll add 770 trillion to the GDP, et cetera. But what's really missing is the kinds of employment benefits for community and society that are unleashed. Yes. I think Preeti brought up such a relevant uh, model. So Preeti, I have a question that I'm going to then, after you ask everyone, how hard was it to you for you to find your customer and what as a home-based entrepreneur to begin with, what were your sort of considerations in mark, thinking about your market linkages? Yeah, actually uh, I faced so many challenges because not much awareness for the oyster machines. The people were like that it's a non-veg. So uh, the, they were not uh, ready to use it, ready to purchase it. So I'm working on it uh, with the uh, help of social media and uh, through blogs and uh, YouTube channels and like uh, other uh, posts and uh, other challenges like the shelf life of the fresh oyster mushroom is four to five days. So just uh, by using the uh, dried oyster mushroom, we, uh, uh, we are making the mushroom based product. So it increases the shelf life uh, to 365 days. And uh, the dried oyster mushroom we can use in number of ways, like by adding the oyster mushroom powder in uh, different recipes, uh, in chocolates, buddy, satome, like this. Got it. So I just want to uh, come to Pratnia first. Uh, when you're thinking about the templates, and I'm sure you had many women sort of take them up and action them, have women come back with you for support on market linkages? 
uh, helping us get uh, formal finance externally, et cetera. And can you just share a little bit about that? Absolutely, uh, Sanjana. In fact, that is the key need, uh, you know, to get connected uh, to the end market. So um, the, the business in a box is helping you to get there, but uh, what they actually want is the connection, right? Uh, so, so can you, for example, introduce me to a, a bigger company that is willing to take produce from me? Can you help me get onto an e-commerce platform that will allow me to sell? Right, so getting um, women ready to get on these platforms or creating the market linkage, creating that relationship with various different entities that will give the direct access to uh, the product or the service is really what the, uh, the ask is. And the same thing with credit linkage. So what Sairi is doing, for example, you know, uh, will you guarantee me funds? Fine, I'll go through the business in a box. I'll get myself readied up. You know, I'll I'll build my credit worthiness. I'll do all of that. But finally, can you guarantee me the funds? You know, that's that's the main ask that uh, continuously comes into us. That's so interesting to hear. Sorry, I know when I'm uh, on the Shiro's platform, I think a large part of commerce actually happens there, where community is buying from each other, and uh, part of the you know the sort of women will and your online training, there's also talking about women, uh, market linkages for home-based entrepreneurs. But formally, what is your community trying to do at Shiro's to help enable this? Absolutely. So um, uh, I think uh, it, taking from what Pradna just said, a lot of, lot of um, women who are building something are, you know, uh, entrepreneurship is a step-up game, right? Like once you've reached a level, you want to go to the next level. However small you started, you constantly want to grow. And that's something we're cognizant of. So, uh, and obviously, um, India's a large country. The scale, scale is just astounding. So a lot of how we think at a design process is to say, hey, how can we do this for a million women at a go, you know, and how can we do this for a large number of people? So we've been taking a platform approach, uh, you know, to everything that we're building. Uh, particularly now we realize that every woman is an entrepreneur. It doesn't matter whether she runs a small tuition center or she teaches yoga or she runs a parlor or she, whether she offers a product or a service or she resells, um, everyone wants more customers. So a little bit of how we've been thinking about the product is, hey, Let's sort of, so we already have a community, women converge, it's a me space, uh, it's a high trust space. Uh, the natural step was to convert that into a community marketplace, which means that today I have a profile, I make content. Tomorrow I am, uh, I can I can literally go from being being just a creator of content to, to being in commerce by uh, being able to set up what I call my shop on Shiro's with, when you know under a minute you get a personalized payment link you get you get the ability to create a catalog so what we realized is today a lot of people are let's say the earliest business entrepreneurs are whatsapp folks they you know they ping their friends and they sell we all have done it and then there is let's say shopify there's nothing in the middle right shopify is for businesses who have figured like i'm going to make whatever crore a year and then of turnover then let me sort of invest that the large mass sits in the middle. People who have crossed, let's say, 10,000 rupees in sales and are still not at the crawl. And this is the person who wants more customers, more discovery. Uh, and of course, the best of best brands today bank on content. We already have the content capability. So all we did was literally create a personalized shop for everyone that can be done in under a minute. Uh, payment options that are super simple, whether you want to send somebody a link or create a payment link for every product you sell. So while my listing might say 100 rupees, but I can send it to Sanjana for 94 rupees. And being able to do that in under a minute is a little bit of a superpower in today's world and being able to sort Absolutely. of apply that. And because there's a large community there, there's a little word of mouth, uh, there's, there's cross discovery, and of course, making sure the platform brings discovery to you you're just not an entrepreneur you're also somebody who's going to the next level so the women will program is a little bit of uh so just for folks who don't know uh, we women will is a, a program we run in partnership with google where we 
recruiting about 1 million women entrepreneurs through through an acceleration process but it's all digital and it sits right in middle of a community so you walk into the community and then you can choose to say oh i'm going to be part of this and um, so it's social experience meets mentoring if you will an interesting part is all the mentors come from the shigas community women who have been there who are, who are paying it forward so the trust is very high and you don't feel judged and you don't feel intimidated by you know the the dryness of you know how business learning can be sometimes and lastly of course the number we map is like your own income level so for example the first pilot we ran for women were we saw a um, 60% of cohort increasing their annual incomes by 50% which was an interesting way to sort of say that and these are all really simple things you know how to use canva and how to use instagram and how to create great content and how to follow up with your customers these are a lot of small 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 detailed things but when you add 100 of these in a year it becomes like really substantial and the person's able to uh, you know move to the next level i'll give you a small example we have an entrepreneur named bhavni bhavni was actually part of the cohort uh, when we first started and today bhavni is a mentor because she's grown her business she's created more employment she sort of walked the whole path and now you know she's doing it for other folks and you know and the most fun part about this is when women entrepreneurs start building these businesses they also employ more women you know it's it's a little circle so it's the antidote to the bro networks if you will and i think if we do more of this it's it's going to be massive just uh, bain numbers apparently uh, they about 15 to 20 million women who run a small business of some sort we expect that each of uh, these women employs anywhere between 2 to 5 people today if if we keep growing this ecosystem this number will become 35 million women entrepreneurs which i think is uh, is going to employ anywhere between 100 to 180 million people in next 5 years or so so and at least the way things are uh, this thing called internet is is our workplace now whether we like it or not everything is sort of happening here and here's a generation of women who leap frog they went from literally offline and nothing to that notebook led business to 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 being digital on day one and i think that's mm-hmm. what's sort of powering a lot of a lot of this so what we really doing is building these pillars all digital capital is digital acceleration is digital community is digital learning is digital and when you add all of that up what you have is a is what we call a trust code to say here is a life cycle of this very bankable person and you're building not only financial capital but also social capital which has a compounding effect over a period of time so bhavini can go from just just an entrant into a learning cohort to somebody who is now an employer as uh- um sorry we lost you for a second oh sorry uh so i was saying basically it's a lot of these done many times over basically every time we create a bhavini uh there is a little bit of compounding there that's fantastic i think you said two very relevant things for a great segue the first is the internet is our workplace and it's not just for women and there's so much of talking about compounding about hybrid workspaces but i was recently listening to mark benihoff who ceo of salesforce right and globally they have these huge salesforce towers which are these extraordinarily fancy offices and what did he say when the pandemic hit they went and bought slack because the future of the workplace is the internet nobody's coming into the towers anymore i need to own the rails of where people work and i think taking that narrative to not be about oh it's it's more hybrid women can operate it's not hybrid everyone is going to work on the internet now so that's a great point uh the second thing you brought up was about jobs and i want to pick dr niharika's brain on this uh especially in the context of the anganwadi or women who are starting up they're not going to want to be entrepreneurs immediately 
they come from very you know capital light environments and mindset still needs a lot of uh, assistance it's very likely they're going to look for a job with another woman first so in in the thinking around the delhi project what's how are we approaching job creation as sort of a supportive uh, piece for women entrepreneurship or, or are we just looking at women entrepreneurship exclusively and just your thoughts on this um so i guess um you know you um, in every community that you will have let's say three or four women who will be entrepreneurs uh, there might be another 10 or 15 who will actually work with the entrepreneur or for the entrepreneur depending on how things work out so uh, i i don't think um, you know at this stage one can say if somebody is interested not in setting up a business but let us say setting up a cooperative or setting up a you know four or five women working together to uh, to meet a need of the market um, i would say that would also be a good idea uh so for example we have been um, you know we've talked about this several times talking to the electronic sector skill council uh, there is a piece rate there is there is work that women can do uh, in let's say assembling a switch or or assembling something and and there is a huge demand for these at this point of time uh, and if one could train uh, the women to do that and start earning some money which could be the step towards possibly setting up some something for themselves uh, so i i'm not picky um, in my mind at least about you know what they would uh, but i also don't Uh, really think that um, you know one wants to be uh, so much a part of the exploitative piece rate business yeah uh, i think it was uh, some time ago and i don't know what the numbers today are but in amdabad uh, when the kite season comes um, there is a there's a whole economy that gets put in place about in making those kites and um, i'm t- i'm quoting numbers which are about 10 years ago uh, so uh, you know for 100 kites there's there's it's really like a piece rate so somebody would just be doing the 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 frame and for 100 kites they get paid something like 20 paise yeah uh, or some uh, somebody is only doing uh, sticking the tail of the kite and so again for 100 they get 10 paise or something like that um and uh, of course with the volumes it is still an act, um, it it adds to the income of the family uh, but i think it's fairly exploitative absolutely uh, in that sense yeah. so i don't want to be just you know uh, um, at least in the design thinking of uh, simply uh, plugging into that part of the economy but really look at where there is a real value add and there is a real possibility of the woman feeling like what she is doing uh, is really contributing uh, to her self esteem of course eventually it also ends up you know changing her space in the family and her voice in the family and so on and so forth but in the beginning she has to feel good about it so i think i would see it as something that really adds value and of course also improves uh, the possibility of being a um, a job creator yeah. even if it's four jobs that's good it's, now i think that's so well articulated and i remember sometime earlier we had also talked about sort of the toilet board and opportunities with that yes. and i feel like one of the trends we constantly see is where businesses are sort of gendered and your customer is either women or children there is more acceptance from the family it's easier for women the guardian sort of come come down a little yes. bit and we see that a lot with things like tuition centers beauty parlors etc because these are sort of feminized businesses so as somebody once told me i'm not a suspicious entity anymore if i'm a beautician <laughs> as opposed to anything else i mean unfortunate truth but this is what we have to work with so just moving on from this and you brought up a really interesting point about being working in exploitative models and right now we're at this point where the number of opportunities in the gig economy where you can check in and check out is massive and it we actually started this conversation with the question of who's doing research and development on emergent high value opportunities so i want to go to pradnya for a minute and just try to talk to you about as you develop like incredible workbooks business templates etc 
how are you thinking about sort of version 2.0 of emergent high value opportunities? That's the first part of my question. And the second is really to Preeti. Uh, Preeti, you operate uh, in sort of a green business in many ways, right? It's sustainable, circular economy, et cetera. Have you ever been able to sort of uh, enjoy the benefits of schemes and uh, services from the government that have been earmarked for you and what your journey has been? Uh, so I think we'll start with Pradhya and then we'll go to you, Preeti. Um, so Sanjana, um, you know, looking at what we focus on, which is more the business process management side, um, I see a lot of changes uh, that need to be uh, incorporated in the way we do business here on. Right? A lot has changed. As I uh, said, and as you are saying, the internet is here to stay. Right? Things have become digital. How do you do digital marketing? How do you leverage social channels? How do you um, get into communities like Shiro's and really leverage that for your benefit. All of that is new to most um, women, right? So, so I would say uh, in terms of opportunities, I think there is a big world out there for uh, direct to customer interaction and engagement and how to best leverage that um, to, to grow your business, to maintain your relationships with customers is something that uh, needs to be looked at and needs uh, education and awareness and the tools to do that. So that, that's one thing. Uh, the other is, of course, finances. So once you get your funds, and this has always been an issue, especially in the context of women entrepreneurship, where women themselves believe that they're not good at financial management, which is not true. It is a learnable uh, skill, and it's not the men of the house who understand finances. We can understand it, uh, if not at the same level, much better. <laughs> right? We've been handling money in-house, out of, out of house. So so, you know, how do you really uh, put a structure around that? Um, really, how do you understand personal finance? How do you understand business finance, your cash flows, your turns? Because most of the businesses, at least the ones that we work with, are based on having enough cash in hand, uh, right? So, so how do you work with your suppliers? How do you work with your customers so that that remains um, sacrosanct and you have cash in hand? So, so that's the other thing. And again, especially in the e-commerce economy, um, what, a, what is the best for me in terms of how much cash is going to go out when I go on to a certain platform? What does that all mean uh, is something that uh, that needs to be looked at. Um, and then, of course, you know, teams and how to, how to work with uh, a distributed team, uh, maybe not uh, relevant in some context, but um, again, if you have a team and uh, they're all distributed and now you're having to work online, how do you really manage team engagement, team motivation, um, making sure that everybody is working at full power? I think that's the third important thing. So just in terms of business process management, um, I think these are the three um, things that need uh, that, that need to be looked at, re-looked at, revisited, and new things introduced in, in order to be able to do a good job. That's such a, yeah, that's a great insight on distributed teams. We also recently, uh, in a conversation with entrepreneurs, um, one of the interesting insights we got was women in the 40 to 55 age group. They're at a point where kids have left home, they've sort of built enough social capital in their families and people are willing to back them to take a risk. They said they don't have the opportunity to join any accelerator incubator programs for me. There isn't anything. They usually want under 30, under 35 young people. And they're like, you know, we, we arrived on the internet at a point where we didn't know Instagram or we ran a business and we failed. And so how do we do that? And that's a great uh, TG also to work with. The second insight we got was also very much around what you said, that a lot of women who started businesses about a decade ago or five, seven years ago, they did it at a time where the internet was very different uh, and they rely extensively on hiring others to handhold them. So while they don't want to learn the skill themselves, they really want to know that they're not getting, uh, you know, duped or taken for a ride and the language and vocabulary. So that's also an interest. And the final uh, insight we got from someone was to run cohorts for women who are failed entrepreneurs. Uh, nobody explicitly talks about that, but failure for home-based entrepreneurs is, is en masse. We don't bring them back in and it's a great pool who already has a risk appetite. So something to consider. Preeti, very quickly before we go into questions, did you get any government schemes for your, and how was that experience? And I ask, yeah. in the, I ask in the context of, you know, we're home to World Solar Alliance. There's this huge push for green and sustainable financing for women. Uh, what's your experience been? 
actually not especially with the any government scheme but yeah uh, i'm connected with one uh, women entrepreneurship program sap that is uh, working under i am and the one and we raise funds uh, almost 8 lakh rupees by dissolving 2% equity and they liked our uh, business idea just because we are supporting ecosystem work on that and uh, and definitely uh, thank you and definitely uh, for uh, the women entrepreneurship program can build and support uh, uh, women network and communities to uh, to work for the guidance to learn new skills and for money utilization and for uh, compliance uh, compliances like requirement for to scale up their business i learned so many like these uh, most important points in, in my last two years journey by connecting uh, the Thank you. Uh, we just have about four minutes, but if anybody has a question, can you just raise your hand uh, and we'll direct you to your speaker of choice. Uh, and thanks for a really active chat. I'm looking at all the comments. Uh, I hope everyone's posted their number and connected. And if you've signed up, we'll send you a follow up with all the details. So I think uh, Gayatri had a question earlier on. Um, I can't see it now. But uh, yeah, Gayatri, do you want to share your question? Uh, yes. Um, so I was actually asking about, uh, I work partly with the, the livelihood sector and a lot with the entrepreneurship sector out of cities like us. Um, the, Question for me is a lot of women come up and say, we are not ready to start a business because the risk seems a lot. I don't have the means, I don't have the basics, but there is a need for the intermediate step. And I was very happy to hear you and Harika talk about it, Sanjana. Um, is that, but the caveat is the exploitative sense that, you know, how do we find, but can we, like, I was just kind of getting a sense that that is what Chiros is trying to do is to see, okay, can two or three of you, can can you be part of a production cycle and then come up with a product? So the market linkages that we talk about so far have been with, okay, you produce a produce something and sell it in this marketplace, but is there space to create an intermediate space to say, okay, I um, want packaging for my soaps. Can you provide that? Uh, and somebody else in the marketplace says, okay, I'll do the design for you. And here we have a supply chain that's, emerging in the same space. Uh, I'm an idealist, so I'm hoping that, you know, this, this is something that really does work, uh, but there is a space for that. The second aspect is, I think one that Aparna and I, uh, we keep talking about this, how do we bring a lot more women uh, and get them into trying entrepreneurship, learning how to manage money and even just start a business for their own livelihood. Uh, and one of the things we hear is that the space is not welcoming. Uh, uh, it is couched in terms of difficult, uh, you know, uh, intimidating in that part. I think a lot more could, we could do to make the space more welcoming. Uh, I think the Astra is doing a bit of that. Um, I think the Anganwadi idea is good. Go where the women are. Uh, and, uh, and one of the ideas that I, I have been trying to get someone to listen is, how do we integrate places where women already are uh, to do that? Anganwadi is good, but you know, where do women go other than that? Uh, it's one of the places and I'm seeing a lot of resurgence in utilization is the post office. The reach in our country is pretty good. Uh, can we have like a, 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 a sister who sits there to say, okay, how do we kind of look at government schemes? How do we kind of look at this? And um, women like in-person con contact. So can we look at that as well? And uh, where do I go to deposit these kind of ideas is my question. Mm -hmm. so you, you come to game. <laughs> I'm already there. I consider myself part of the family. So yes. And I, I share the ideas, but uh, who, uh, and Harika, Preeti, Sari, who would like to sort of take some pieces of this? Sure. Um, can I add here, uh, uh, I think it's really important to I agree with what you said, Patrick. I think uh, the great ecosystem is all about cross pollination. Mm -hmm. I think mean, the best ecosystem is entrepreneurial ecosystem. It just became very easy to cross pollinate. You know, mm -hmm. least, honestly, it shouldn't feel like work. It shouldn't feel like institutional work. 
and it shouldn't feel heavy. You know, the best entrepreneurial successes have happened when it really feels hard in another conversation and just another thing. Uh, and I think at Shuru, that's how we always got about things. Like we have to take away the judgment from the whole process and we have to increase the amount of trust. But human beings per se are entrepreneurial. It's just that we, as we keep adding layers of judgment, and especially it happens with women a lot, you know, that's why we become fearful to say, oh, you know, all of this. So a lot of our thesis is to say, keep building new spaces, spaces that, that are that are safe for us to do, to learn, to experiment. And, and everyone has their own roadmap. I think one of the hardest challenges is to be able to give everybody customized success or at least a way to customize success without, uh, without losing a sense of scale, you know, and, uh, and the truth is those models do exist, you know, so whether they exist in an AMOL or a, or a microfinance or Silicon Valley, I think the playbooks exist in different cohorts uh, for us. What we also know for a fact is that uh, we are far less forgiving of women's failures. The truth is if we want a lot more women to succeed, we have to make space for more women to fail as well, you know, and I, and the truth is anybody who's built something has built it literally on a graveyard of failures. So we we got to make this okay for folks to do it at their own time and pace and their own capacity, but also to say, hey, this didn't work. I'm going to try something else. Or, uh, you know, like, for example, like even in, in lending, we know women have very good NPA. Uh, I mean, you know, our NPA rates are really uh crazy compared to the rest of the industry because women are good borrowers, but that also means that they've been so tight about it, you know, that, uh, you know, and of course today we haven't cracked the institutional method of getting that right or subsidizing some of the failure to say, hey, it's all right till this time ecosystem is growing. And like, for example, COVID came and I, there was some help in place, but a lot of women really went into a lot of distress. So my, long answer short is that we got to make more space for trust and non-judgment uh, in our ecosystems. And I think we're all, all sort of doing it in our own ways and a lot more cross-pollination for this person to know, okay, as I cross levels or as I do other things, I can, I can get that help. I'm not going to be isolated, whether it's my success or my failure. Well said. Uh, I know we're three minutes over, but we had one interesting question, which I thought uh, we'll just take. I'll ask Pradnya. Uh, so the question is from uh, Vidhu and Vibhu, sorry. Uh, just a second. Vibhu, do you want to ask your question, please? Um, I can read it out. Uh, if, yeah. She said, the question is, how do you figure out what business to start? Sometimes it can be quite overwhelming and it's difficult to have clarity. Would love to hear your suggestions and thoughts. So I think um, very key is to find a problem to solve. And the problem could be as, um, you know, as simple as, hey, in this region, there is no restaurant that serves Spanish food, right? Something, something that there is a need, number one. Uh, marry that with what your passion is. Do you like cooking? Do you like cooking Spanish food? Well, there you have your second point. And third, will people buy? Right? If at that intersection, um, everything works out, then that's a good business idea. And then, of course, you know, the business in a box templates are there and other things are there to help you along the way. But the, the opportunity spotting, um, I think, needs to happen at the intersection of these three things. Fantastic. So I'll just take a minute to summarize and thank everyone. Um, I think there's three big things that I've learned today. Uh, and it starts with actually what you said at the end, Pradnya. I think our ability to self-diagnose and figure out an, a problem and whether the way that I fit and whether there's a market opportunity, that's going to be critical. And maybe articulating that explicitly uh, so that people know I should be looking out for that. It's a useful public good. The second is just, you know, as the identities of women entrepreneurs keep moving, that access to finance fees, um, the access to market fees, it, it's always changing. And we should keep in mind that that's an, the women entrepreneur is an evolving entity with multiple identities and sort of build bottom up from that perspective. 
Uh, and I think the last piece, and when I'm looking at the chat, is cross-pollination is everything. <laughs> Organic cross-pollination. Just in today's conversations, there's probably 10 more interactions that have sort of unlocked themselves. Uh, it's really going to be important as this ecosystem develops that all of us, whether as a nonprofit and a for-profit, we seed ideas, talk to each other, and find the opportunities that maybe we can build or someone else can. So my final ask is, like I said in the beginning, if you believe that you can either add value with the work you're doing, you have business ideas, um, you want to join any of the existing fantastic work that's going on, please do write to us. A warm thank you to Dr. Niharika, who's all the way from the other side of the planet. Thank you for joining us. Um, Pradnya and Deyastra, those templates are incredible and we'll be sharing it with everyone who signed up and joined. Sari, of course, has been a supporter and who's really taken community approach to building for women seriously and it's amazing. And finally, Preeti, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. We hope to support you. I saw 50 farmers in Silvasa are now going to work with you. So congratulations and thank you everyone for taking the time uh, and joining us today. Bye. Thank you, Sanjana, for running a very good uh, webinar. It was lovely. Yeah, substitute batsman. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> I don't think my kin would have done a great, uh, such a good job, sir. <laughs> so maybe I'll make it to the main team. Yes, <laughs> next absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.